Good evening. Uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki. Uh, welcome to tonight's program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, I am the chief evangelist of a company called Canva out of Sydney, Australia. Tonight we're joined with Elisa Camhort Page, uh, the co-founder of Blogger. We go back many years, um, a few South by Southwests too. Yep. <laughs> and Carolyn Guerron. <laughs> is that French enough for you? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Co-founder of Canawise. And together they co-authored this book, The Roadmap for Revolutionaries, Resistance, Activism, and Advocacy for All, along with Jamia Wilson, who unfortunately was not able to join us tonight. The book is a toolkit for anyone looking to change the world, to dent the universe, as Steve Jobs would say. So please join me in welcoming Alyssa and Carolyn to Inforum. Thanks. Guy, I thought we'd switch it up a little and start by asking you a question. Oh, yeah? <laughs> um, you Not on this list. I sorry, <laughs> yeah. You contributed. We wanted to have a foreword that told the stories of several people and the first time that they knew they could change the world. And I asked you to contribute. And you did. You contributed to our foreword. But it wasn't the first time. It was perhaps the most recent time. Perhaps, yes. Um, so why... Tell, tell the folks a little bit tell about your con contribution and why you chose it to be your contribution. Yeah. So this was about September of 2016. And I went to Berlin. I'm a, another hat that I wear is I'm a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador, which is one of those thankless jobs that somebody <laughs> has to get paid to drive a Mercedes. Cry me a river. And so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> get the violins out. Yeah. <laughs> So I was in Berlin for a Mercedes event, and I happened to have dinner the night before with two friends. And they're about 45 years old, and they said, you know, guy, to this day, we wonder, and if they're still alive, we ask our grandparents, what were you thinking? Why didn't you resist Hitler? How could it have come to be? And then they said to me, you know, guy, it is 1930 in America. And you don't ever want your grandchildren to wonder, did my grandfather resist Donald Trump? And that was a pivotal moment in my life. And I decided that I would not have a situation where my grandchildren wondered if I resisted. And that day is when I sort of flipped and all my social media started becoming political. And I've taken a lot of heat for it. Uh, we're going to discuss boycotts and boycotts. It's sort of related. I've taken a lot of heat for it, but I've also gained a lot more followers. And net positive, completely net positive. And so when I was approached by you, I thought, well, that's a great story because, you know, we're at a cusp here, and uh, you're either going to be on the right side of history or the left side of history, and I think I, I hope to be on the right side of history. So that's why I did it. Well, thank you for doing All right. that. All right. All right. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's... <laughs> Let's start with something highly positive. Tell us uh, your favorite success story of everyday activism, an example f that will inspire us. Well, uh, one I, that's in the book that I think is really an indication about how getting involved with your local government and local politics can make an impact on real world people. I have a friend in San Jose named Courtney McAvinta. She founded an organization called the Respect Institute many years ago, um, and it's trying to address the school to prison pipeline because her family um, were, her father, her brothers had been to prison. She was an at-risk youth, and she works with at-risk youth. And she decided to get on the Juvenile Justice Commission in Santa Clara County. That's an appointed position. She didn't have to run for office. She expressed the interest. She went to some meetings. She showed why she was qualified, and now she's on this commission. And one of the first things they did was change the age from when kids get sent from juvenile hall to adult prison from 18 to 20 in Santa Clara County. And those two years make a huge difference in people's lives. The recidivism rates and the, you know, the success outcomes that are possible when you come out of juvenile hall versus adult prison are really different. And this was based on this appointed commission of regular citizens researching and presenting this as a great idea to the Board of Supervisors. And now that they've got that done, they're working on community college curriculum for those kids because, because the kids used to leave at 18, it went up through high school. Well, now they're there another two years, so now they're developing curriculum 
uh, at the community college level for those teenagers. And again, this sounds, to me, this is a huge thing. To me, this affects real families and real lives. And she didn't have to spend a lot of money. She didn't have to run for office. She didn't have to be an extrovert. She didn't have to be, um, you know, a lot of things people assume. You, she didn't have to take to the streets. She just got in there and did some work with a working commission. So that's one of my favorite stories okay. from the book. I think what I love most is that regular people are activating and they're running for office. I have one right here in the audience, my friend F. Matt Hummel. He's running for Oakland City Council. He's a general <coughs> contractor. He builds things and he wants to change Oakland for the better. I think it's very important that uh, people just can stand up and say, you know what, w what the heck, why not me? And um, another example is uh, our friend Megan Hunt. She's running for the Omaha um, the Nebraska legislature, and she is a single mom, runs a boutique. She's a wonderful girl, and she's just like, I can't stand it anymore in America. I got to do something. So why not me? Why shouldn't I run? And I think that uh, in our book, we do show people the steps that it takes to run, and it's not just for Bill and Hillary anymore. It's for you know, our neighbors, and they're running. Well, I think people think about Congress, and Congress can indeed cost a million dollars to run for Congress, and it is very much about money, and, um, you know, there's a lot you have to do, but there's so many other options, and that's how the pipeline gets filled, first of all. So you can spend time at the local level building your network, building your purse, building your credibility, and then go from there. Not everybody has to. I have a friend on the school board um, for the Mountain View Los Altos High School District. And all he's interested in is running for the school board. And he says, he, you know, I just saw him yesterday. And he said, uh, you know, I'll probably run for one more term. He doesn't want to run for city council. He doesn't want to do anything else. He's like, I don't care about potholes. I care about, <laughs> like, education. So that's his end game, you know, to contribute through the school board. But so either it's a long-term goal for you or it's really one specific thing you're passionate about, there's a lot of actual desperate need for participation at the local level. Well, well let's say you know, you've now evangelized us on this concept. So people listening to this, people who are here, they go home tonight, they shut their podcast, like, what's the next step? So the next step for, for those of us who live here in this area is to go to your county's um, uh, website, uh, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, San Francisco County, and you can find a list of commissions. And there are literally dozens of them. Do you care about animals? Do you care about foster care and adoption? Do you care about the environment? Do you care about developers and what they're doing? Do you care about housing? Do you care, like, how many issues do you care about? There is probably a working commission focused on it. They have meetings every month. They are open to the public. So that's one way is to go through your county and start looking for those local commissions. Another way, if you're really uh, passionate about party politics and driving your party in a certain direction, again, go, every party is broken. And in the book, we have the whole breakdown of, you can start at the national party's website, find your, find your state party, find your county party. And again, they have monthly meetings. They have volunteer calls. They have all sorts of things that are happening right at this level where, again, they desperately want your passionate participation. Um, and we think about everything about politics, about being about Washington, D.C. But by the time it gets there, it has gone through a lot of levels of being screwed up. So you could actually make <laughs> more impact right where you are and try to, from the ground up, you know, or what some people might say is grassroots, try to address issues from the ground up, from the local up, and help the national politics that way. And also look for areas where they're not represented. For instance, I'm in the cannabis industry. It's rural. It's got so much money and uh, ag tech in it. But how come nobody's running for office? How come women aren't running for office? And we were asked by one of our partners, Vote Run Lead, you know, we're looking for women in rural communities. I'm like, hey, ever heard of the cannabis community? They're all uh, rural communities, and they all should run. And it's the very beginning of it, what we are working on something right now within our industry to make that happen. It's going to take about six months, but... Well, will, will someone who's coming from uh, <coughs> the private side, will they go crazy? Will they see that, you know, you can't move... You know, Steve Jobs would just say, all right, all the waste baskets have to be this shade of black. And the next day, they were that shade of black. He didn't, you know, go through the council or vote or anything. So will they face frustration? Is it a new kind of environment challenges? What, what, what do you encounter when all of a sudden you want to 
put a rail trail in you know Santa Cruz County and well the vast majority of us aren't Steve Jobs who can just dictate no well, what color yeah. all wastebaskets can be <laughs> yeah. even in our companies or in our homes <laughs> we all have to compromise and negotiate to get what we want and yes there's there's a part in the book where we interview uh, Megan and and a bunch of other folks who either have run are running have been appointed and we sort of put all their advice together and one of the questions we ask them is what has been disappointing and yes there's a lot of compromise and negotiation and a lot of like things don't always happen quickly in government um but for most of us we don't we're not really the dictator of our lives and everything anyway we're we're negotiating and compromising to get what we want in life always so those are good skills, you know, you're, those are good skills to learn to be able to negotiate with people and get what you want and, and advocate for positions. Um, but, but of course, politics is only one chapter in the book. Like, it's only one area. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that you don't have to, if you're already thinking, but I don't want to work in government, there, there's a whole lot of other ways to contribute. Like what? Well, I personally am in favor of your economic vote and how you spend your money every day. This is something that's been important to me for decades. And it's not just how you don't spend your money and boycott. It's how you do choose to spend your money, which we call boycotting. And where you send your money matters. And that also goes to where you're invested or what you divest from. So uh, does anyone know how much... Um, what dollar amount of stock you need to own in a company to be able to put a shareholder resolution in the annual meeting? <laughs> what? Well, it's $2,000 worth, actually, which is not that much, you know, and I think more people than realize could do that. And it's just a way of trying to get people activated around something, like give people something to activate around and then, you know, get, get, a movement going. What's your favorite other way? I was going to say to just, I love the whole idea of bypassing systems and creating your own. And um, don't wait around for a MacArthur grant to um, <laughs> get, get your show on the road. <laughs> Go be the Himalayan Blindness Project, seven doctors, and work on a million pairs of, a million eyes. Isn't it a million eyes? Huck, no. Holtz. Through a cascade of many, many hands. Of course. Right. Yes. And, and so Dr. Jeffrey Tabman and Huck Holtz and, and a few others, uh, they spend their summer vacation 14 hours a day doing cataract operations in jungles and people can see sometimes for the first time. And I call it medical resistance because they're not waiting around for a grant or foundation money. They're just hitting the road. And uh, they're, can I say that how do you get through some of these airports is you put uh, porn and chocolate and just pay off the officials and Get, smuggle your medical goods in and, and just hack it. Just hack your way through. That's great. Uh, is your experience that boycotts really work? I, I've been on the other side of a boycott where um, this clothing company that I know uh, called the viewers of a particular channel idiots. And so there were many people who said, I will never buy another shirt, vest, pants from you again. And he was going crazy. He was thinking of resigning. He was thinking of hiring a PR firm to mitigate this emergency. And I said, you know what? None of those people are going to buy your things anyway, so just right. calm down. And literally, a week later, back to normal. Yeah. So, But that's a boycott. So I, I also will tell you my personal experience with boycotts, which is I read an article about Patagonia, and I, I swear to God, I, the next day I went and bought a Patagonia wet, wetsuit, and then I bought some pants, like $150 pair of jeans from Patagonia. I don't know wow. what got in my brain to do that. <laughs> but I, so it's like somehow, you know, so I understand boycotts, but do boycotts truly work? Well, I think all manner of protest, uh, these are cumulative effects mm -hmm. that happen. So any one boycott has, if it really hurts the pocketbook, yes, it can work. But it's also when it's in tandem with shouting out to social media, with getting out and um, uh, protesting in front of headquarters. Uh, one example might be the divestiture um, 
from the 1980s um, when when there was a lot of activism around divesting from South Africa to protest apartheid. And you could say, well, those college students, they weren't really customers of those big banks anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it spread and it began to affect reputation, which is another kind of currency companies have. And ultimately, it was part, and artists got involved. Something in our book that we talk about is how use the skills and the tools you have. And if you're an artist or a musician or, you know, that that also has a role in advocacy. And I think that is an example in the 80s of that coming together, the kids on college campuses, musicians and artists, people not wanting to use those banks anymore. And, and one could say there's a little mini divestiture you know, sort of bubbling up right now with a lot of the banks because of funding, for example, the detention centers for um, immigrant families, things like that. And, and so, yeah, I think it all, I think one of the points of the book is that there are a lot of tools and a lot of approaches and make your mix, make your own mixtape, I guess. I'm going to date myself now, make a mixtape. Right. <laughs> Choose your adventure, right? Choose your adventure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I've often wondered this, that, you know, I live in a bubble in Silicon Valley, surrounded by a left-leaning liberal, you know, like you me. Think. Yeah, and so I read, and and you know, I hear, you know, you should write to your politician, you should write, you should call, you should do it. And I'm thinking, well, I want to call up Diane Feinstein and say, yeah, you know, I'm I'm with you. Yes, you why? I mean, yes. she's, it's not like I'm going to change her mind. She's already like-minded. So what what should people do who are in areas that their politician is already aligned with them? Well, it really matters because in Washington, D.C., it's about compromise and negotiation, just like anything else. And I've over the last year and a half, I went to two town halls of my congressperson. And that was one of the questions I asked at the first one. And she said, listen, we quantify who's calling me. And here's how we use the data. The first way we use the data is that, listen, I live in a blue, blue area. I know my constituents I agree with me, I agree with them, but there are a lot of people on my party that don't live in areas that are such slam dunks. And they're walking a much finer line about how do they get reelected so they can go to D.C. and vote along party lines without um, going so far that they alienate their constituents. Well, we use the data from some of our bluer areas, in her case, to say, here's what's out there. And, and especially for those politicians that have national ambitions, they really do care what the nation's people of their party think, right? So that's reason number one. That's how she uses the data. But the second reason is she has to know what she can give up. She's not going to get everything she wants, right? So if thousands of people are calling her about health care, but there are thousands of people are not calling her about immigration, she has a sense of where her points of leverage and negotiation are. It doesn't mean she doesn't agree with, um, it doesn't mean she wants to give up anything, but she needs to know how her constituents feel so she knows her points of leverage. And people were very concerned about the death threat, so people were calling and saying, hey, you know, we're with you. Yes. We that, got you. Well, that also really, uh, I mean, actually, yes, they really enjoy hearing from their constituents. And did you know that's the number one way um, to really influence your congressperson is, first of all, show up at their town halls, show up, make appointments at their office. When you're in Washington, D.C., did you know you can go to Capitol Hill and visit your congressperson? That's what they're there for. They have staff. You can make an appointment anytime you go. Um, second best is calling. Um, after that, every other method is, like, way behind. Uh, how about the flip case where should someone living in Northern California call Orrin Hatch or Lindsey Graham and say, you know, do they care what someone 3,000 miles away, you know, eating kale, wearing Birkenstocks, <laughs> smoking marijuana cares? I mean. <laughs> Again, their national ambitions matter. Yeah. So they do care about national ambitions. No, I'm, I, I don't think they care so much about <laughs> people who are not their constituents. Um, but you can contribute to their districts or their states in other ways. Support the candidates in those districts or states. Support them with money. Support them with phone banking or remote texting. You can support the other side in, in a state or district that's not your own. They are not so much going to care what their non-voters think uh, about it, but you can help the people who do care. Look at what's happening in Texas. I mean, we're all vo vo absolutely behind Beto O'Rourke. Right. Like, he's like, uh, he's like our new Colin Kaepernick. He's like, <laughs> yeah, go. <laughs> Bill Maher, we're excited for him. We're, it's like a team sport. And it's, uh, 
I didn't really pay as much attention to Texas before, but now I'm glued to anything coming out of Texas. And I think that's something, uh, you know, if we're talking about partisan politics, that's something the GOP has been really good at for decades now is really funding and supporting at the local and state level so that they're building constituencies and building candidates. And, um, yeah, it's outside money. And that's how they'll criticize it. I mean, if they want to criticize it, they'll say, all oh, these outsiders. But, hey, it's, you know, the pot calling the kettle black because that is what the GOP has been doing since the 1980s. And if you want to give your money to outside districts and states, it does help. Okay. Uh, are there, is there a pecking order of the right way to become an activist? Do you have to, you know, tie yourself to a tree? <laughs> Do you have to, you know, <laughs> stand in front of the Japanese whaling ship? I mean, what, what's, uh, how does it work? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to speak to my friend, Captain Chuck Swift from Sea Shepherd. We used to work together a okay. little bit. And um, he said, basically, well, if you're going to be an activist, like an eco-warrior, mm -hmm. there's other things you're going to give up, like girlfriends, <laughs> dating, <laughs> someone <laughs> renting you an apartment, you know, even <laughs> issuing you a credit card, especially if you have an a, a FBI record. It, like, everything's a little harder when you choose that life. And, and he, he chose that life, and he wanted that life, and, and that's... Um, a very rewarding life. And he has a wonderful wife and, and child, and um, I don't know if he's going to go on another uh, mission, but uh, yes, he did chain himself to a redwood tree. He did uh, was a member of Earth First. Mm -hmm. But he said not everybody has that in them, and they need to realize that what they have to give, what they have to contribute, can be accounting, could be cooking activists a beautiful meal after a long day of being tear gassed or <laughs> babysitting is a big thing. Like everyone who has kids, like I'll watch your kid while you're at the protest or we'll do a little daycare center. Just little things you can do to help the movement is um, just do it. And you don't even have to go to meetings every week to say, hey, I'm available like six weeks from now for that protest and I'll, I'll watch your kids. So I think that there are currently about 25 things that I could be upset about every single day. That's all? <laughs> That's, a and list. That's just one guy. <laughs> yeah. and, um, but it is really hard to stay upset and outraged and, and to activate about 20 different things every single day for any length of time. So the number one thing I ask people to do when they're thinking about how they can activate is to triage. Triage your passions. Like what is the issue that keeps you up at night and it's going to keep you up at night next year and it's going to keep you up at night five years from now and pick two or three. Now you can do the, hey, the action for today is we have to call and do this. You can do those things. But when it comes to really where you're contributing the most of your time and the most of your money and the most of your effort, triage your passion, apply your skill set, as Carolyn said, what can you give? Do you have more time than money, more money than time? Um, do you have skills that you can contribute? Um, and so there's no one way. And I think that was kind of the point of our book is to say there's a lot of different things out there that you can do <coughs> to be participating. But the idea is that we don't want everyone burning out and flaming out. And I feel like people are looking at the midterms and saying as an end point, and like <clears throat> either they think things are going to get fixed or they <clears throat> if they like them the way they are, things are going to get reinforced or whatever it is. The midterms are just one more milestone, but we are in this country and caring about what's happening in it for good, right? Or for life. So don't look at that as an end point. Look at what you're going to do the year after that and the year after that. And my whole thing right now is, um, you know, for me, it's work-life activism balance, and when you brought up uh, about people telling you that you would lose followers, you know, and I've been doing this a long time and people always would say to me, aren't, aren't you worried that you'll lose half your potential customers or clients um, because you're open about your politics? And um, I used to say, well, if they don't want to work with me on marketing and social media or content or whatever, because they know my politics, we're probably better off, you know, <laughs> um, not working together. But the other thing I started to realize, first of all, I don't think it's half. I mean, I don't think the numbers are actually that starkly half and half. But There's anyway. There's no way. There's no, no way. way it's half. But then I said, why am I worried about the half of the people that might not like me that I 
probably don't want to work with. Why, I, why, aren't, why aren't I excited about the half of the people yeah. who that will be a bonus for them, what I believe in and what I do and why I'm mouthy and I'm an, out there and I'm saying things. <laughs> They'll like that. Like, those are my people. Those are the ones I should want to work with. And you'll get more of them. Yeah. You will. You really will. I, I can tell you that for a fact. And I tell you, I block people every day. I like to mute them. I just... I like to mute them because I like to imagine them screaming into the void at me and me ignoring mm. them. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you because um, some sites are better than others because ideally you want, to, you want to make it so that they still see their comment and their little <laughs> troll friends still see their comment. But <laughs> nobody else sees those comments. That's the ideal situation. Yes. So you get the... And based on the algorithms of the platforms, you're going to see the algorithm sees a lot of action because there's a lot of comments, <sighs> but nobody else sees them but the troll. That's and his, evil genius. Uh, yeah. So on social media, does it help if you, you see a post that you agree with? Do you like it? Do you reshare it? Do you... I mean, well does, first that, I does that move the needle in any sense of the word? Well, first I would research it yeah. and make sure it's not just that I like it, but that it's actually accurate and, and worth sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, yeah, it helps. And in fact, when we uh, interviewed Soledad O'Brien for the book, um, I asked her if, like Congress people, should you call the media to influence them, what should you do? And she says, oh, don't ever call like CNN or anybody like that. They're, they'll have the most junior intern taking the calls. And uh, she goes, they watch social media now to know what to talk about, to mm -hmm. know what to cover. So it absolutely, that is where your social media influence, if you have it, is really, um, can have impact. So right? what should you do? You see something on CNN that you like. What, what do you think? would impact CNN the most? Well, it's not just you. It's rallying people. Okay. Like, you, Unless you're a really super big influencer yourself and you alone can like Move the needle. reach you know, millions of people, what you do is you rally people and you tag people and you, you try to get people a little worked up. Okay. Anything to add? I was just going to say uh, some of these movements have taken off very quickly, like Me Too, for instance, and Pantsuit Nation. And, you know, it starts with a Facebook page and a bunch of angry people who aren't going to take it anymore. And then you have this amazing viral artwork, the Shepherd Ferry, um, the Hope poster with Obama, and then the Grope poster with Trump. And that gets, <laughs> it's, it goes, it's like peanut M&Ms. They go everywhere. Everybody wants it. Everyone posts it. And I think it's um, using pop culture and artwork to bring forward some of these um, movements and give them a look. Kay. And this is part of our inspiration in the book. We wanted to use um, that, like viral, I need this, I want this, I want to uh, make it work for me okay. and share it. Uh, I have to ask, because <laughs> I really want to know, what do you use as your news service? What do you rely on? I stopped after the election watching the 24-hour news channels. Yeah. I couldn't, the way I process information and emotion, it was overwhelming me and making me so angry and upset all the time that I wasn't, it wasn't healthy for me and it wasn't actually helping me be effective. So I have a bunch of news feeds that I get that I rely on. But the main thing, and, and we actually have a graphic in the book about left to right. If you want to get outside your media bubble and you want to look at across the spectrum, they're all media outlets that at least attempt to be journalistic. I mean, we didn't put every, there, there are plenty of left wing sites that I think are nonsense and plenty of right wing sites, right? So it's across the board. But to me, the most important thing is if you're, and when I first started doing this was actually with Ferguson, um, Missouri, when I wanted to find people who I could tell were on the ground, giving me the real scoop. Um, so I found a local alderman that I started following and a local news person and a local, and then I started saying, well, who are they talking to? And I followed the breadcrumbs, which takes me back to my old, old days of social media when, you know, we started blogging and we started using online community and we would follow the breadcrumbs to find who did we want to listen to and who did we want to talk to. And so I try to find reputable 
plugged in people who are on the ground somewhere to figure out what they're saying about a situation. That's how I try to keep on top of things. Totally. And I'm with you because our book started on literally election day and Mm. we were horrified and then it just went into more horrified and then action. And so if I am a news junkie, I can't stop watching, but I I also can't keep watching because it's bad for my health. So (laughs) um, I'm lucky to be friends with some great journalists. One of them is sitting right here, John Boytnot. He did our fake news section in our book. And uh, if I really want to know, I'll ask one of my five good friends who are in the field. Um, I also think that um, Craig Newmark with Neiman Journalism Lab has done a wonderful job um, just trying to keep it all above board and keep it all fact-checked. And um, he's put a lot of, what, six million bucks into that because the press is dying, literally. They're being poisoned. Well, you know, (laughs) the thing is, I... For a lot of that, I hold more the social media platforms responsible a little more than anything because I think they have a media business model but didn't want to have the responsibility of being a media company. Um, And I think that really contributed to uh, the problems we see with the propagation of false information and the propagation of hate speech too (coughs) and the unwillingness to to moderate um, what was happening on their platforms. So for me, that's, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to rely just on what I see on social media. I do want to find the underlying, where's the source, where's, where's the resource that, that I can count on. Um, and that's really important and great journalism is really important and supporting it is really important. Um, if I heard you right, you're saying this guy here is like an expert in He's a good journalist. Fake news and journal. He, he Can I hand you the mic and you explain how to determine what's fake? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> uh, okay, just remembering uh, what I wrote in the book. Because uh, <laughs> uh, you put me on the spot. But um, uh, one of my favorite uh, signs of a fake news site is like Houston Chronicle dot, or Houston Chronicle com dot co. If you ever see anything like that, watch out. Um, because that's something that does exist. Like the fake URL. A fake oh. URL. You know, those are, those are yeah, those do happen. Um, what else was in there? Uh, Whitehouse.ru? Oh, well, I never... <laughs> right. Usually... Oh, guy! <laughs> yeah, something like that. Overly salesy speech that's supposed to... Yeah, yeah. When you... When you um, when it, anytime you see phrasing that's, you know, uh, m- that, that isn't actually citing a group of people or, uh, uh, you know, the, the jur- a journal or an organization. It's actually citing, um, you know, or it's not even citing anything. It's just saying, uh, you know, many people think or many people say or that type of thing you'll see in, in some fake news sites. Um, and also, uh, you know, I, I recommend there's a, there's a tool called SimilarWeb. Um, if you, uh, you know, type in the name of the, the site, you type it up, up top, then you'll actually get to see how many millions of people or thousands of people or hundreds of people go to the site each month, similarweb.com. It's free. Uh, you just type it in the top left. So you can kind of get a sense for whether or not the site is like blogger, whether there's, you know, 800,000 people a day there or there's 800 people a day there. So that's something that you should probably want to, uh, uh, you should probably want to take a look at. Also, incendiary headlines. We need, the list could go down. There's there's one liberal site that is kind of like uh, you know liberal fake news porn. It's called <laughs> it's called Palmer the Palmer Report, and uh, it's it's a great site if you want to go see what what one really anti uh, Trump guy has to say. And it, the 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 headlines are really inflammatory and kind of like joyful. They're they're, they're <laughs> you know they're kind of like. You know, Trump is going to jail because this that he just did. You know, that's not even does it justice. It's just like so. You have your you have you know that's a good example of a fake site on the liberal side, and then there are too many to count on the other side as well. So I think the thing is, anytime anytime a headline is either immediately outrageous to you or or wish or wish fulfillment on the other side, mm-hmm. you should be have a healthy skepticism for it. And also reporting every side of the story. You have to report, your, you know, if, even if you're a liberal journalist, you report what you believe is true and also the opponent it has to be reported. Unless they're All Nazis. Yeah. I don't think Nazis yeah. have to be reported. Yeah, but, you know, exactly. Don't journalists. you think that um, when all the dust settles, Wikipedia is a very good site for that? <sighs> Wikipedia, you know, okay, mm. so I'll say something else kind of. So 
we some people long for the days when you know and i'll date myself here when we grew up you know and there was just abc nbc cbs pre-cnn maybe you got the local paper maybe you got uh, one news magazine or you know there were a very limited number of sources and i know people who long for that day because americans had a single kind of source of information but the people who made that information all looked a lot alike mm-hmm. and they didn't look like me And they didn't look like a lot of people in this room. And so to me, I was a utopian for social media and online media. I mean, that I did see a utopian opportunity there to have more voices and more representation and and more perspective from, as I said, people on the ground. Um, And that has gotten corrupted, unfortunately. And so the problem with Wikipedia is it is like the media of my youth where the people who who do the writing on Wikipedia and the checking all, it's very homogenous. It's very demographically homogenous. And that's my only, that's well, it's very white male. And that's the only thing about it that concerns me is it's as homogenous as our news sources were back in the seventies, you know, but, but I do, I use Wikipedia every day. Well, I mean, you know, my, my kids, uh, their teachers tell them not to cite Wikipedia. And, like I, I asked the teacher once, so let's say they're writing a report on Planned Parenthood. So you're telling me they could cite Fox or Breitbart, but not Wikipedia. How does that make any sense to you? And because probably what their teacher wants them to do is go look at the bottom of the Wikipedia page where they list all the sources okay, yeah. that the Wikipedian right. used to right. write it and go look at those direct sources themselves. Okay. I mean, I can't, kind of can't argue with that. Like Wikipedia yeah. is the gateway to it's a bunch links. of other sources. It's all the links. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's say people here or listeners, they're going to go for it. And so one of the first things that they have to figure out is fundraising. So do you have any tips on fundraising? Well, the first thing is you have to ask, and that is hard uh, for most of us. Um, But you just have to get used to asking and get used to most people will say no. But the people who say yes become part of your fundraising network. And then hopefully it grows, you know, again, it's that growing the grassroots. Um, And also remember, it's time plus money equals the outcome you want. If you have less money, you're going to need to spend more time building the relationships and getting endorsements or getting people to sort of weigh in with their social media to support you in other ways that aren't money. Um, If you have uh, more money, you can probably get to some things quicker. But it doesn't mean you're out of the game if you don't have that money. Absolutely. And I'll reference our friend Megan Hunt again. She does it in a very charming neighborhood way. She basically goes to the local donut shop and says, we're going to have a a canvassing party, and could you maybe provide some donuts? And it's just what donut shop wouldn't want to give this wonderful woman who's done great work in prison education reform and reproductive rights and of course you know they're going to want to help her and uh, your local pizza shop your local anything like people will give what they can give easily but they don't necessarily want to whip out a checkbook or a paypal account but they'll maybe give you three dozen donuts Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) yeah you know canvassing runs on donuts right (laughs) okay um we're about to go to audience Q&A, but I, I would also like to hear from you. So we're out there, we're, we're interested, you've evangelized us, you've you know, psyched us up. Now, name some organizations that we'll, we can look at and say, yeah, that's what I want to be. That's, that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of organization I want to create. And, uh, you know, they did it right. They're an inspiration. They are the apple of fundraising to show my prejudice from the past. But, you know, yeah. that or fun, not just fundraising, but the, of activism, of changing the world. What's this the hero organizations for you? Wow, we list so many of them in the book because every chapter has um, in the it has a field guide and a glossary in the beginning, so you know the language we're speaking. Because I think sometimes activism books or political books kind of talk over people's heads and reference things. I use jargon. I mean, in tech, you know, we're really good at jargon. So, so is so is every other industry. So, but uh, every chapter also has this resource thing at the end where there's all these different organizations. So. Um, you know, I think that you've got, so I'll use uh, reproductive rights as one of my top issues. So there's actually a three-legged stool of amazing 
organizations that support reproductive rights, and all of them are important but doing different things. So you're probably most familiar with Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood is all about providing health care and providing women's health care and advocating for free access to it. But there's also NARAL, and they are devoted to electing pro-choice politicians. They focus on the political world. And then there's the Center for Reproductive Rights, and they focus on legislation and policy, both... Um, um, domestically, and they also do work internationally. And so you have um, the, the lawyers, the politicians, and the healthcare providers. And those organizations together are really necessary to help support reproductive rights. And so it's all about like finding that thing that you can focus on. I think focus is good in most cases. What are your... Uh... I would say Planned Parenthood, um, uh, Surf Rider Foundation... Uh, sea Shepherd, and also National Cannabis Industries Association and California Cannabis Industries Association as far as making change and just being out there and being policy makers. And I don't think anyone's getting wealthy at any of those jobs. I think it's a, an absolute act of passion, activism, resistance, need for change, um, absolutely showing up, um, doing the good work, um, Compassion Coalition, um, fighting for veterans' rights to cannabis and uh, people who are sick who can't afford it. So my friend Ann Kelson here is a member of that. And uh, just, you know, just being, being there and standing up for others. And I also think there's some great organizations that have come up out of recent gun, uh, gun control and gun safety um, issues. So Every Town for Gun Safety uh, and Moms Demand Action. Um, the Moms Clean Air Force around the environment. These all start at the grassroots with a bunch of people getting together and saying, we don't actually want it to be like this anymore, and we are going to organize, then we're going to use our platforms to amplify. In the book, we have uh, the thing you've probably heard a lot, which is think globally, act locally, and we say scale digitally. So take that and find your people and then start raising your voices and then find people who will give you smart actions. You know, what are the actual actions people can take to be solution oriented? Because I do think that we have a lot of like howling at the moon and, and we need the sort of feet on the ground going forward, trying to make something happen too. And when you say scale digitally, what does that mean? I mean, getting right down to the brass tack, what should they post? Well, I think what has been very useful is to use... Um, a lot of these organizations use online petitioning tools. We have a section in there about online petitions and what makes them powerful and how to spread the word and how to what to do with the results of that petition once you have it, right? Because that's the next step to use to to organize around hashtags. People can call it slacktivism, but you they make a difference. It makes a difference when you have millions of people aware of an issue that they weren't aware of before because people rallied around a hashtag. So I'm a big believer in using social media and using online petitions and using these tools to support actual then policies you're asking for, politicians you're supporting, um, organizations you're trying to grow. That's what it's there for. It's to support it and provide it with some underlying awareness and then getting people to act. And slack, slacktivism is really just activating the time you have. And I don't even like the word slacktivism, but I understand why it's used. There is absolutely no shame in showing up for 10 minutes a day. It can be a pebble in a pond. And if you post the right thing and it goes everywhere and all of a sudden, you know, all these people are now like, Kavanaugh, no, uh, you've done your job for the day. And maybe it took you 10 minutes. There are a lot of organizations that are here to help you act in a very short amount of time, like fivecalls.org, mm -hmm. ResistBot, um, organizations like that, that you go to them every day and they say, okay, here's today, here's the calls you need to make. Here's the things you need to do. And again, I... I I, I want to emphasize that these are not new tactics, right? These are tactics that have been around for a long time, and I just think they're getting more um, mainstream, that more people... How many of you went on a march in the last 18 months that never went on a march before? Oh, you're a super activist -y crowd. <laughs> how many of you called your congressperson, you know, in the last 18 months and you never did before? I mean... That's a lot of people showed up to vote and like that was their check. My, that's my civic duty. And I, you know, for a long time, that was my civic duty too. But there's so much more civic duty we can enact. Okay. 
How about we go to audience Q&A? I see a hand oh. over there. So I've lived in the D.C. area uh, for all of my life until three weeks ago. And D.C. is pretty much on fire right now and has been for uh, a little over two years. And people are really upset and really angry and really scared. And uh, people are also very homogenous and um, very informed and very involved. And that leads to a lot of decisive anger towards people who aren't part of that homogenous group and so uh i'm just wondering if you guys have any tips on balancing being involved being resistant uh which is something that's like very emotional and close to the heart and, and should be with still being compassionate towards everyone and keeping an open mind hmm yeah, that's that's a, <laughs> that's a big topic about the 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 topic of empathy for people who disagree with you, which I struggle with. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I I struggle with it up, you know, once it gets past a certain point where I'm like, okay, if you actively like want harm to me or my family or people I love, like I'm sort of done feeling empathy for you, and that's what it feels <laughs> like right now, and that's what makes it so challenging. Um, and I do think I learned from many years at BlogHer, I was a partisan blogger before we started BlogHer, and then BlogHer was an omnipartisan site where we wanted people from every, you know, ideological, um, part of the spectrum to speak at our conferences and write on our website, and I was often the one inviting them, and so I thought, okay, well, if they see me being super Palmer reporty, um, <laughs> you know, then they're not going to really trust that they can come and have a respectful engagement. So I learned how to ask questions differently, ask questions that really were questions instead of saying, a, making a statement in the question about how horrible the you know, people were, um, and how to have respect. And I w can't let somebody else make me be disrespectful. That doesn't necessarily mean I always feel empathy, but I do try to behave respectfully because that's who I am and it is challenging like I don't know if that answered mm -hmm. your question but now I feel bad for blocking all those people no no I'm no, <laughs> no I'm, you know. I'm, I'm from Washington DC I understand um, your pain and uh, <laughs> most of the children of Washington DC are children of DARPA and defense families and Pentagon families and FBI families and my f I have Pentagon FBI CIA a lot more NSA. I mean, the list, it's like Ramon's song. It goes on forever. <laughs> but, but there's a deep state of activists in D.C., and a lot of it was fueled by the punk scene of the 80s. And I can promise you, from Rock Against Reagan to lot, lots of the bands, and um, actually our illustrator for our book, Josh McPhee, was a part of that scene. And it, it is very much a part of D.C. People think it's just Suits and Brooks Brothers and, you know, Kavanaugh. Um, no. There's a, there's a big activist group. Um, we did things all the time. We did pop-ups. We did protests. We did art protests. Um, they're there. You just got to find them. Involved in protests and active in whatever area they care about. So. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was with my friend Ann Kelson just a couple weeks ago, staying at my dad's house, drinking coffee out of an air-to-surface weapons missile satellite coffee mug. <laughs> and she had a satellite NAFSI undersea surveillance submarine warfare defense uh, systems coffee mug. And <laughs> we, we got ready to go down for the, um, the um, National Cannabis Bar Association. We were, we were there. And we were, Cannawise was exhibiting. And uh, Ann and I were like, let's do a flash mob. And, and we got to go find some handmaids because there were all these handmaids, uh, dre women dressed up like handmaids protesting down there during the Kavanaugh hearing. So we were just like, let's go. So D.C. is fun for that. You can just <laughs> go down. There were all these women just silently protesting, dressed up like Offred. Like, that's beautiful. This is what we live for. And the optics of that are incredible visually because that gets shared around the world. We have a question over here. Evolution, a radical and pervasive change in society and the social structure. Well, what, how do you manage depression 
after participating of all the changes, an example is Iranian situation. And if you were living around here in the 70s, in the 60s, you saw the demonstration of Iranian students, right? Well, what do you think about this? If your, your result is not the end what you were looking for. Well, I think a lot of us are feeling that right now, right? I mean, that is one of the the delta between what we many people expected was going to happen almost two years ago and what we got, you know, th and there are a lot of different ways you can react. And I actually respect, like, depression's going to be part of it. You're going to be sad. You're going to be angry. You're going to have, like, feelings and stuff. And, um, and that's okay. And it's just about how you manage that, allocate your time to that, respect that, and then, but also ask, what can I do now? Who can I join forces with? Who can I rally? Um, so I think it's, it's all hands on deck a little bit, and you just got to respect your feelings along the way. They're rational. I mean, it's rational when you don't get what you expected and you don't like the outcome. It's rational to be angry and depressed. Right, but also, uh, if you remember in Blade Runner when Roy was dying and, you know, the, the light that burns twice as bright burns half as long, Roy, and <laughs> you just, at some point, you got to take care of yourself. You got to go to yoga. You got to do sail. You got to surf like Guy with his arrow and I sail and uh, Laurent surfs, my husband over here, and uh, it's like at 5 o'clock, I'm sailing or I'm doing something, or I'm hiking, because if I don't feed my brain, if I don't get away from that beast called the news engine and social media, I can't be an effective activist. I can't write. And I'll tell you something, writing this book was not easy. It was depressing as hell. It was really fun, and I loved my authors, but the more I learned and the more I kind of dove in, it was just like a tunnel. And on the other side, I was like, I really kind of can't wait till this is concluded because it, it's it's tough to research this stuff yeah so self-care for your you know for your mental health so you can be you know live to fight another day well that is true yeah self-care is kind of a cliche but you know it's actually true at some point you have to take care of yourself if you're not in there fighting that's worse than if you're in there fighting but a little less time or a little less intensely or on a few fewer issues yeah. We've got another question back here. Hi. Uh, Hi. So I run uh, one of the activist Facebook pages that we're kind of talking about. And uh, I c thought it was really interesting when you said the hiding in the different communities, because I find that the difference is that people really believe their narratives. It's not necessarily that they're trying to promote po politics. It feels like they're totally living in different worlds where it's about belief, sy belief systems and opposing storylines rather than just mm -hmm. politics itself. So yeah. I would like to know how would we start to break through the echo chambers? Uh, how do you move past social media blocking, muting, trolling, raging? Uh, what would be necessary to create a more, res not just a more respectful and polite environment, but also one where people can genuinely be informed? Okay, so I might say something that, that I don't think I'm here to try and fix um, people who are committed to having a different set of facts and information. And I don't know if that's the way to win either. If what you ultimately want, like right now we're in triage, right? That's what I keep saying. We're in triage. And for me, the people, uh, you know, who are looking to try and, for example, flip the house or flip the Senate, like that is not, I don't think the top priority triage to try and somehow fix or, um, re-educate people who have a totally different narrative going, which is what's happening. There are two different sets of news. There are two different narratives. And I think that actually is wasting energy and time in this particular moment in time in triage. For me, it's to get the people who are not voting, who are theoretically on your side, but physically are not turning out, and to try and reach those folks that is, I think, it's the energizing of the people who already agree from a political point of view and just maybe are feeling disillusioned or are feeling a little disconnected. 
but you're still basically wanting the same eventual outcomes. To me, in our current moment of triage, that's what I would do. That's how I would be advising people who are trying to accomplish those goals um, is to rally those. That's my personal opinion on what I just think that there's a whole lot of, I don't want to say brainwashing. That sounds really condescending, but there is a different narrative going on. And I, I don't know. I don't have the answer on how you break that narrative as long <clears throat> as we're not going to, um, as long as we're going to decide that that gets to be called a news channel or that gets to be called, you know, a news website um, when it's, it's basically creating a different reality almost. So that's, uh, I have a different perspective on, on what to focus on, you know. And Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. So I always try to keep that top of mind, even when I'm dealing with someone I absolutely, completely disagree with, like a, like a Nazi, for instance, or someone who wants to build a border wall or put children in camps. Um, it's so, I get so sick of going high, though. It's so, it's so, it's so tiring. Really? Yes. Yes, I do. Sometimes I just want to go low. Yeah, I gotcha. <laughs> but I'm used to being there, so I'm trying to be a, yeah, you're a Michelle Obama now. You're a good example. Thanks. <laughs> We've got another that. question back here. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I was wondering about different platforms that you're aware of that you think have promise or kind of fit the bill. In terms of calling your senator, I think Brigade is trying to increase your awareness mm -hmm. of and contact with your representatives, mm -hmm. of which there's half a million, as they point out. And then uh, Wiki Tribune is bringing some of the decentralized, some of the design to the, to the news. It's a, created by the Wikipedia people. And then uh, very interested in how to coordinate and synchronize boycott and not buying cot, the boycott. <laughs> that sounds really powerful. Use markets. Yes, used markets, yeah. We're, um, so you n ma named some. I named some earlier, like Five Calls and Resist Bot, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. I actually have the Congress switchboard in my favorites just on my phone because from there you can get to all your people. Um, so I just have the phone number in, in my phone. Um, and there are, <coughs> let's see, there are other, there's a Purple Patriot, which is, yep. I think, located up in... Uh, Seattle. There's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs right now who are trying to create um, this kind of tool to help people. Um, I'm Brigade. I just you just mentioned Brigade. Yeah. I just loaded that. I'm checking that out right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I kind of go for uh, I I have used ResistBot. I do just use the switchboard and call direct. Um, and I really would encourage people to look at your congressperson's schedule for town halls, and I really do encourage you to go in person and see your real-life congressperson. That's their job. And I know not everybody lives in an area where their congressmen do that job, but in this area, our congresspeople do that job, and they come and they do town halls, and you ask questions. And, um, you know, the people who show up, here's the thing I really notice is, like, when I go to, like, for instance, the ACLU is a great organization, and they have this whole power to the people movement, which is one of the organizing um, things around uh, issues. And when I go, I, I am not a spring chicken, and I'm the youngest person at some of these meetings all the time. When I go to my city, my county board of supervisors meeting, or I go to my neighborhood association meeting, or I go to power to the people, or I go to a town hall with my congressperson, I am often the youngest or among the youngest. Um, and that's, what does that say? it's, it's back to this issue of like, it's forget about the people who are for now anyway, and in, in triage, perhaps beyond agreeing with you for the moment, like you don't have the time and energy to try and like convert people, but there are, who are the young people in your life? Who are the people who are 18 to 27, let's say, and are, do, are they even aware of these mechanisms to organize? Are they aware of these mechanisms to participate? They're aware of other mechanisms for sure, but are they aware of these ones that can help them come together, you know, with a whole other group of people who are activating and aggregate 
I mean, to me, aggregation is is the powerful thing that social media helps with, and it's the powerful pe- powerful thing in, in real life getting together as well. And I wanted to add to that uh, with, with Parkland and Emma Gonzalez and, and her team. They have a little um, office set up next to a deli in a strip mall. And uh, obviously, it's, it's moderated by adults, but they've been partnering with other youth groups around the country. There was one group in Maui that um, some friends of mine work with, and they raised like $25,000 at um, a, mus- a little music festival they threw, and they just PayPal'd them. Here you go, guys. And uh, they're high school students. So I think the kids got it better figured out than some of us, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. We've got a question here in the back. Ah. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to ask about uh, if you want to rally a lot of people c- for the campaign to be more impactful, do you think it'd be better to resort to reasoning or emotions? Oh, oh man. What a great question. Uh, yeah, emotion. 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 And who do they know and love who is going to be harmed? When you think about certain movements and how it seemed like they were forever you know, I, I think marriage equality is one of those movements that just hit a tipping point where what didn't seem possible 20 years before became possible. But it's because people began to realize that they knew and loved people who were being harmed. And I think everyone coming out and talking about whether they've had an abortion or not, whether they're an immigrant. I'm a first generation American. Both my parents are immigrants. And, um, when we know each other and when we know more about who we love, we care more. I mean, I wish we all just intellectually cared, but I think it's emotion. Absolutely. And we've got time for one more question over here. Aside from policymaking, what other avenues exist for social change? (sighs) Well, I think, um, first of all, I think everyone's got a book in them and it's not just for Ernest Hemingway because I I went to Clearly. design I went to design school and I wasn't really technically a writer and I pitched the Anti Bride series to Chronicle Books and they just miraculous miraculously gave me a three book deal. So if you think you can't publish, you probably can, and if you think you can't write, you can learn, and the more you do, the better you'll get. And um, just just publish or perish because mm-hmm. you got to get your words out there and your artwork. And don't be shy about it. So if I think about what all the other chapters of the book are about, because there's one chapter which is about government. Um, The first chapter is about protest and civil disobedience and why it matters and why it does work and why it's not a wasted effort. Um, The second chapter is actually about protecting yourself online and off with your data. And protecting your data can be a radical act. Um, Protecting it from commercial interests, protecting it from the government. Um, and locking your shit down, basically, um, is not what they want you to do. Many entities. Um, third chapter is all about that economic pressure. I'm a big believer. I, how I spend my money is my vote every day, every single day. I choose every dollar is a choice. Um, and then the last chapter is about things like your schools, like people forget about your schools and colleges. And there's a whole thing about educational reform and equity in schools and campus sexual assault policies and all sorts of things. And you know what? Again, it, it really does tie back to money, though, right? Because when you're going to college, you're paying them money. Um, and we interviewed both Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and documentarian Amy Ziering about the campus sexual assault issue. And she's like, you bring your questions to the admissions office. Because they're the ones who have to know that there, there is money on the line for whether you choose to go to that college or not, right? So, um, and, and your media and the healthcare system, like there's every institution in your life, even your workplace. There's stuff in there about like, what are the policies at your workplace? And do they have old, outdated, biased HR policies that were probably written 40 years ago before there were a lot of women in the workplace, before, you know, there were a lot of dads staying home with their kids. Um, And look at those policies and just pick one to advocate to change for everybody that works there ever after, right? So there's just everything that influences your life, you know, is is probably ripe for change somewhere. And then build a better mousetrap. So if you see people are sick and they're not getting health care and why, and they're on opioids and their liver's about to fall out on the floor, someone like Pamela Hadfield of Hello MD said, no, I'm going to do a, a telehealth 
a comp company and platform where we actually will diagnose you, you don't have to leave your house, and the medicine will be a lot less expensive, and it will heal you. Because I believe cannabis heals, and um, we the people proves that out um, with the shrinking of tumors. And I think that like hacking the medical system, medical resistors like Huck Holtz and uh, Pamela Hatfield are doing that right now. We've come to the end. <gasps> what can I say? So um, it's a inform tradition to ask all our speakers a last question. And the last question is, what is your 60-second idea to change the world? 60 seconds. Well, it's not in the book, but one of the other top passions in my life is that I am a vegan. And so I would just encourage people to eat less meat, dairy, and eggs. Good for the environment, good for your health, good for the animals, good for the planet. Good. Carol? I didn't go to law school, but I would love to see um, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg School for Young Child Attorneys and Supreme Court Justices to be. <laughs> and I don't know how I would get it funded, but <laughs> I think somebody out there <laughs> would probably do that. And All I right. think if we could get the Supreme Court fixed, we could get a lot of things fixed in this country and we could be better leaders and in the world and stop right. being so toxic out there. All right. Thank you. So... Listen, I'm an author also, and I will tell you that when an author tells you to buy and read some other author's book, that is the highest form of praise. It would be like a chef telling you, go eat at the other restaurant. And I have read this book. It is beautifully designed. Um, I, I don't like those kind of books where the author takes 200 pages to express one idea. You know, like, <laughs> if you tip, you'll be successful. Um, so <laughs> I'm telling you that this book is filled with practical and tactical things. Not a passive voice, an active voice, sort of checklist-oriented, um, great resources. I've never read a book in my life till I read this book about if you're tear gas, this is what you should do. I found that very <laughs> instructive just in case one day. And so I, I, as an author and as someone who has um, tried to dent the universe also, uh, this is a great book. I'm telling you, it is truly, and I do not say that very often. I don't even say that about my own book. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really, you should all, you should all buy this book and read this book, and even the people listening, I hope they'll do this. And so, I, I just want to close by thanking Alyssa and Carolyn for joining us tonight at in forum. And uh, they will be out there signing books in the lobby. So I'm Guy Kawasaki, and my guests, Alyssa and Carolyn, uh, we wish to all thank you for attending and listening. If you're listening to this afterwards, and uh, have a great evening or morning or day or wherever you are <laughs> when you hear this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.